You know, uh, my title is Can You Chem Can Your Chemistry Make You Unhappy? And it wouldn't be a surprise that I'm going to say no. Okay, and and I I'm 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 hoping that this uh, DVD will be uplifting to people who think that their chemistry destines them to a life of unhappiness. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the boogeyman of psychology, you know, that your genetics and your and your chemistry is going to do you in, and you're really powerless to do much about it. So, um, so that that's what I'm going to be talking about. And the assumption that's that's prevalent in the world is that uh, that your chemistry is the cause of your mental illness. So, for example, with depression, that the chemistry is a cause-effect relationship to depression and feeling down, and that your chemistry is a cause-effect relationship uh, in, in the case of uh, anxiety. You see? So, uh, I'm going to be talking about that assumption, and I'm going to be challenging that assumption, essentially. And I'm going to challenge it in many ways. I'm going to challenge it logically. I'm going to challenge it in terms of my experience of working with people. I'm going to challenge it in terms of research, brain research that's been done with PET scans. And I'm, I'm even going to challenge it to say that even, even, if, even if you have uh, aberrant thought patterns and feeling patterns because of your chemistry, so I'm saying is, is, not, is not necessarily true, but even if you did, uh, we have the power within us to transcend that. So that's, that's basically the outline of, of, of the whole um, of, this, of this DVD. All right, let's talk about logic. Okay? Now, if you, uh, you see, it, if you checked, you would find out that in a large city, when the storm, the storm drains, those are the, 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 that's what keeps the water from flooding as these storm drains. You would notice that the storm drains, uh, the water is high at the same time that there's a lot of use of umbrellas. So people have their umbrellas up and the storm drains are high. Now, I don't think anybody would say uh, umbrellas are causing the storm drains to go up, or the storm drains are, are causing the umbrellas to come up. Yet they're very statistically linked. I mean, they would be very strongly linked, but because something is statistically linked does not mean that there's a causal connection. So the assumption that's made generally that the reason that people uh, look to chemistry in terms of explaining depression, anxiety, and other other mental, dis mental disorders, the reason that they uh, make the causal effect is because, make the causal connection is because they say, look, everybody that's depressed has a low serotonin levels. They have a deficiency of serotonin. So they make the connection that, therefore, uh, there must be a causal connection. The, the, the deficiency of serotonin must be the cause of the depression. Okay, and, and as is the case with the drains, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the drains and, and, and the umbrellas, there's a third factor there. See, there's the rain. See, the rain causes the storm drains water to go up, and the rain also causes the umbrellas to go up. You see? Now, as regards depression and serotonin, I'm going to suggest to you that there's also a third factor, and the third factor is thought. Okay? At a critical mass of, of negative thought, you get, it affects serotonin, your serotonin level, and it also affects the depression. So it lowers your spirits, and it lowers your serotonin level. So that is 
the logical flaw in, 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 in showing a cause-effect relationship between depression and your chemistry does not account for the fact that there is a third factor that is affecting both of them. Now, let me give you some of my experience working with people, how I discovered this on my own about, well, I've been doing this for about 35 years, maybe this was 30 years ago, or, or maybe 25 years ago. I was working with a, uh, what's called, at that time they called a man of depressive client, uh, and he was on lithium. So he comes in and I talk to him and I, you know, try to uh, give him an understanding of how the mind works, which is how we, we help people. And he was very receptive. Okay? So his uh, level of understanding goes up. His spirit's left. You can see that in his face. And I'm thinking, oh, gee, this guy's doing really good. He wants a really responsive client. He comes in the next day and he's got big bags under his eyes. And so what's the matter? He says, well, George, I'm getting all this headaches and stomach trouble. He lists all these symptoms that he's getting. And he says, I'm thinking that they have to do with my medication. So he calls his psychiatrist in California. Uh, and the psychiatrist says, yeah, side effects. Those are, that's, what, those are exactly the side effects of lithium. I want you to cut your dosage in half. He cuts his dosage in half. The side effects go away. Okay? Now, it seems to me that if his level of understanding goes up, if he got mentally healthier as a result of the meetings that we had, His serotonin level must have changed for the drug to, to, to be cut in half. That's my assumption. It's not hard to see that if you think about depression. Because when people are depressed, they don't breathe as well, their, their circulation isn't good. Now that, you would think, on the surface, that that would affect the chemistry. But in addition to that, I concluded from that, my word, people's chemistry is affected by thought and not the other way around. That's what I concluded. And this was back, you know, before there was any way to prove that. That was the conclusion that I had. And it happened with, with just about any client I had on chemistry. I had that was on medication, just about every one that responded to treatment would end up calling the psychiatrist, getting a lower dose, and in many cases getting off their medication. And my conclusion is, gee, their improved mental health must have taken their chemistry up to improve their chemistry. Now, that was a theory that I had, and um, I took that theory with me when I did a Grand Rounds at a Florida hospital. And at this Grand Rounds was psychiatrists who were researchers in the chemistry, in, in, in the, the chemistry of the brain. And uh, when I was talking about it, uh, they came up to me afterwards and said, George, well, I don't think you understand very well. That's absolutely not true. You, your chemistry cannot be affected. It's, it's genetic and you, know, you can't have someone who has really you know, genetically low levels and all of a sudden something changes them. I said, what about spontaneous remission? Suppose you have someone and they, uh, have, they they're depressed or they're anxious and they have spontaneous remission. 
does their chemistry improve? And they said, well, yes, it did. I said, well, what about their genetics? Did, did their genetics change? Oh, no, you can't, you can't change. I said, so you're telling me that a person that has a certain genetics that you would attribute depression to, they have spontaneous remission, all of a sudden their chemistry is different. What do you make of that? And what, he, what they said was, we don't know what to make of it. But we, but we do acknowledge that people's chemistry does change when they have a spontaneous remission. Now, in George Pransky's mind, people, when people's level of understanding goes up, and their mental health goes up with it. So they used to be struggling psychologically and they caught on to, you know, the, the principles that we teach and their level goes up. In my mind, that's kind of a version of spontaneous remission. I mean, it's spontaneous and it's a remission. So I would say that that was, a, that was the same thing, or equivalent, and, and it makes perfect sense to me that their chemistry would improve the same way it would if they did spontaneous remission. If they had spontaneous remission. So that's the second, uh, I would say, piece of evidence in my mind that your, your chemistry and your mental illness are not causally connected. They are connected via a third variable. And the third variable is thought. And thought has a causal connection with both of them. Okay? Now let's go to move up into, you know, up uh, 30 years or whatever into, into the 2000 and beyond. Uh, 2000 and beyond, there was a lot of research done with PET scans. For a long time, PET scans were thought as being a little risky to people's, to the subjects of the PET scans. But in 2000, they were so safe, they had, you know, uh, breakthroughs in technology uh, that um, they were used for research. And one of the research projects they did was just very simple. It sent a person down, wire them up, and say to them, think of the worst thing that ever happened to you. And then they would say to them, think of the best thing that ever happened to you. Think about your grandkids. And they noticed a, the chemistry was lit up in different places. They noticed that, uh, that the, the brain responded differently and the chemistry of the brain was uh, significantly different. And they did uh, gradations of that. They did the negative thinking for a long time, and they found that very, in, in very quick order, there were compensatory mechanisms in the brain that the brain was attempting to stabilize itself. And those compensatory mechanisms uh, played out in the chemistry of the brain. That's what was happening. So the chemistry of the brain changed in order to protect the person from, from, their own, from themselves, from their own thinking. See, so the you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, observation that I had many years ago and other people had as well, all of a sudden is uh, proven in a research experiment. See, so all of a sudden people are saying, your thinking affects your chemistry. Saying that's a provable fact in research. Your thinking affects your chemistry. 